All right, let's talk about these. Hey, hey, we changed now. We've been talking about conveyances. I mean, we've been talking about purchase and sale agreement. We've been talking about contract for sales, right? Uh, that's one thing. We made a conditional agreement. It's valid. It's enforceable, but it's a conditional. Uh, this is the biggie. This is taking us to when? This is just a, let's hang in there until we close. And when we close, the biggie is not the, the earnest money agreement. The biggie is the deed. That's what's going to stay with you. Because what the seller brings to you is not a purchase agreement or earnest money agreement. What the seller brings to you in exchange for your money, it's a what? A deed. That's what he brings or she brings. is a deed. And again, since we have a new document, we got to start all over again with the statute of frauds. We got to start all over again with the statute of frauds. For that deed to be enforceable, to be valid, it must meet the statute of frauds again. The document, whatever the document is, piece of paper, napkin, whatever it is that constitute a document, and that's contracts. And what a document is, you learn all that in contracts. Whatever a document is, it must meet the statute of frauds. What are the requirements? This time, we all we need is the signature of the grantor. Even if you don't, even if you don't have the signature of the of the buyer, it's still enforceable against the buyer. So if you're a buyer, what's the lesson? It's okay not to sign the contract for sale agreement, but don't rely on that and not sign the deed. Because if you don't sign the deed, you cannot say like you can with the earnest money agreement. You can say, defense, I'm being sued, I didn't sign it. Defense, statute of frauds, right? You try that with the deed, you're in trouble. Because as long as the grantor signed it, right, you are bound by it. Usually what do sellers like to do? Sellers don't like to sign the contract for sale, but they certainly like to sign the deed. You, you see the logic why they like that? Yeah. If they get away with not signing the contract for sale, right, and they breach, they can always say, mm, statute of frauds. But if, if they sign the deed, right, or if they don't sign the deed and they and the buyer does, they can't say that. So they, they, they try to push it so that they don't sign the contract for sale, but you don't sign the, the deed. The name of the grantee must be there. Again, it doesn't have to be specific. All it has to be is identifiable. Remember now on the contract for sale, who do we have to have the name of? Both. A little differences. Now you sit there and you go, so what? Hey, questions in the test. Questions in the bar, brief, in the bar exam. You know, they, they, get, they get you a situation where they're closing. The seller signs, brings a deed that's signed by the grantee, correct? One of the choices doesn't mean the statute of fraud because it's the grantor doesn't sign it and the signature of both is required. No. Only in the deed, only the signature of the grant T is required. The name of the grant, the signature of the grantor, the name of the grantee. Signature of the grantor, name of the grantee. On the contract for sale, you have to have the signature of the party to be charged and the name of both. Both names. As far as the, as the, as the words of conveyance, the same thing. Again, this is consistent. Why? Because you want to know what you're dealing with. Am I buying a house? Am I renting a house? You know, what am I doing? So you have to work uh, words of conveyance. I grant to you, I release my property to you, I convey my property to you. All those are words of conveyance. Of, uh, uh, I release. My, by this deed, I release my property to you. That's words of conveyance. That cannot be misunderstood to be a lease. We have to have again the description of the property. Description of the property. Let's talk a little bit about this because uh, sometimes there is a problem. The property has boundaries. 
Okay, property has boundaries. And sometimes there's a problem, not with the description of the property, but with the boundaries. So we use some general rules to guide us when there's a problem with the description of the boundaries. Right? And what are those rules? Natural monuments prevail over artificial artificial ones. Example of that. I gave you that before, I give it to you again. To the well at the edge of the cliff. And you know what happens? The well is a hundred feet from the cliff. The, the, the property said to the well at the edge of the cliff. But the well is not at the edge of the cliff, it is a hundred yards away from the cliff. So which one which one where does the property go to? To the well or to the cliff? To the cliff. Because natural mo monuments, the cliff is a natural monument, right? The, the, the well is an artificial monument. So in that case, what property do you own? All the way to the cliff. Suppose that it says 100 feet to the well at the edge of the cliff. 100 feet to the well at the edge of the cliff. And number one, the well is not at the edge of the cliff, correct? And is 200 feet from the well. You see my problem here? You got two problems. You have a problem between the natural and the monument, and you have a problem with the distance, correct? Both natural and artificial prevail over distance. So in that case, the, the boundary is going to be either the well or the cliff. Either one of those would prevail over the 100 feet. Right? However, we know that the natural prevails over the artificial. So the real boundary would be the edge of the cliff. Although we have a problem here. The hypothetical again is 100 feet to the well at the edge of the cliff. And it's 200 feet, right? To the cliff. So which one prevails? The cliff. Natural monuments prevail over artificial ones. Natural and artificial prevail over distances. We didn't get to talk about waterways. And I don't think we have to. Um, there's this thing called avulsion. Not repulsion, called avulsion, and relation. And we're not going to bother with that, but I just want you to at least mention it to you, because when you study for the bar exam, you're going to hear those things. What happens if you buy land to the edge of the river, and then there's erosion, and the river moves back, right? Uh, well, um, you know, you always, there's a lot of rules about that, which we're not going to get into. Let's suppose that. It, it, the erosion is the other way. Instead of taking away from the river, it adds. Right? So the land moves up into the river. The river recedes. The river dries up. Uh, just, you know, this is not important for this time, but I don't want you to ever say, I never heard those words. Just keep it in mind. Uh, the words are avulsion, avulsion, like repulsion, and um, religion, religion, like religion, religion. Okay? But that's not important for you to know now. That's all you need to know. All right. Um, let's have some fun now. Because the next thing we have to know is we have a valid deed. Right? Whoa. Following me. Let's assume, folks. <laughs> <laughs> let's assume that, uh, you know, you posted a sign for sale. I called you up and said, I'm interested. Uh, you sent me your agent. The agent brought a document. That document needs a statute of frauds. No problems with it. We sign it, right? Nobody dies. The house doesn't burn, right? Uh, you do a title search. No problems. There are no bombs. There is nothing bad. Uh, the easements are okay. They're not interfering with the enjoyment of the property. Everything is good, correct? The seller now delivers the deed. The deed meets all the requirements. 
of the statute of frauds. Everything is fine. No problems with the boundary descriptions. Everything is okay. Everything is described properly. You know, you hope that everything works out like that, but 98% of the time it doesn't. But ideally, um, by the way, remember that once you sign the deed, the contract for sale merges into the deed. What that means is the following. Let's say that in the deed, the seller promised to deliver it to you a quick claim deed. No, a general warranty deed. But he shows up with a quick claim deed. And you sign the deed. What, what you got is a quick claim deed. Whatever it was promised in the contract for sale, that's gone. You look at the deed. Once you sign the deed, you don't look at the contract for sale anymore. It's done. Over. The term is emerges into the contract for sale. But what is it that you want to do? Once you got that deed, you give them the money, right? Here it is, my hundred thousand dollars. You got this deed. Uh, you don't have to worry about this anymore because usually the real estate company does it or the lawyers do it. But one thing you want to make sure is that that deed is what? Recorded. Recorded. So let's talk about uh, recording. Let's talk about a little bit about recording statutes. This is your assurance. This is your way of assuring yourself that the seller doesn't sell it to somebody else. Right? So what we're going to talk about is a situation where you have a subsequent purchaser. So the question is, when, we're not talking about the, the previous purchaser, we're going to talk about when does the subsequent purchaser prevail over the prior purchaser? That's the question. When does the subsequent purchaser prevail over the prior purchaser. In other words, seller sells house to A, owner sells house to A, owner sells house to same house to B. Both of them are valid deeds, legitimate deeds, right? Two people have good deeds. Who prevails? And in doing that, we have to look at the recording statutes. But there are some basic rules about when does the subsequent purchaser prevail. A subsequent purchaser prevails or gets superior title if first he got a valid deed. If what he got was not a valid deed, and I think the word that we used was what? Forged? If it's not a valid deed, then... Um, the subsequent purchaser doesn't prevail. Number two, the subsequent purchaser must have purchased the, um, the property. Purchased. Let's clarify this. A deed delivered by gift, a deed delivered by, by you know, as a gift, which is not purchased, purchased would never prevail over a previous purchaser. A subsequent purchaser that got the property by gift would never prevail over the prior purchaser. Why? A gift you didn't purchase. And we're talking about when does this subsequent purchaser. So beware, when somebody wants to give you a gift of a house, Make sure you double check to make sure that somebody else didn't buy it before you. You know, pay value. Purchase means you pay value. What is value? Value is a more than nominal consideration. It's got to be more than just nominal consideration. Now here's why I can't help you. Million dollar house, um, you, 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 you paid, uh, you put down uh, $400,000. Is that nominal consideration? No. To me it's not, no. but for some rich person it might just be. I mean there are people that go play uh, in Las Vegas and they play $2 million in one night. But, but the bottom line is that it's got to be more 
you in order you purchase you pay value you paid more than nominal consideration right? you pay more than nominal consideration and remember that you only protected this was one of the last things we did in class you only protected to the extent of the money you have paid at the time you discover the prior purchase. You remember those last two cases that we did? Mm -hmm. You only protect it. So if you have only paid at uh, the time you discover that somebody else uh, bought the land, if you were, you were a subsequent purchaser, uh, you purchased for value, right? And you have paid $100,000 to the million dollar home. And suddenly, a year later, you find out that there have been a prior purchaser, you only protect it up to the hundred thousand dollars. That's all you protect. That wasn't that also up until when you got to know? When, when That's you what I said. Is uh, at the point you find out yeah. when you when you learn of the prior purchase. Why is that? Because you protect it as long as you purchased without yes. notice. That's the key. So, a subsequent purchaser is, gets superior title when he received a valid deed, when he purchased the property, paid value for it, um, when, and only to the extent of the value he paid, when he, uh, when he had not noticed, when he did not have notice, right? That's a bona fide purchase. Now, we're gonna talk about, there's some exceptions to that, race, right, purely race. So this, this kind of generally applies to notice and race notice. But still, that's the general rule. We got three types of notice. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because it's easy. Constructive notice, actual notice, and inquiry notice. Anytime somebody records, puts it on the record, the whole world is on constructive notice as somebody bought this property. That's all they have to give. That's what they have to do. You don't have to put a newspaper ad saying, you know, I bought the house, please beware. All you have to do is record it. That's why you want to record. The moment you properly record, let me use that term. The moment you properly record, you put the whole world on constructive notice. Actual notice is, um, it, you know, uh, it wasn't recorded, you didn't see it, but somebody told you about it. So before you purchased it, somebody told you that that house had been sold to somebody else. And finally, an inquiry notice is, it wasn't recorded, nobody told you about it, but you should have. Have you gone to the house? Had you gone? See, the prior purchaser was living in that property. Had you gone over there and checked the house, you would find out that somebody else got it. That's inquiry notice. And we had a case uh, about inquiry. Again, one of the last cases we did was on inquiry notice, remember? Um, a very specific type of situation in terms of inquiry notice. All right. So, um, what are the three types of recording systems? Notice, race, and race notice. Uh, we, we know, I'm not going to put them up here because I gave you examples, but I <coughs> forewarn you that you need to be able to read a statute to recognize whether or not it's a notice, race notice, or race. It's fair game if we only give you a statute and we don't tell you it's race or race notice. It's fair game. And you need to figure it out. I believe Texas is race notice. Pretty sure of that. But look at those three statutes that I gave you and make sure you understand. Um, under a notice system, a subsequent purchaser takes good title by merely purchasing without notice. Doesn't even have to record it. Under a notice statute, a subsequent purchaser <laughs> is protected by merely purchasing the property. These are the examples I gave you where somebody purchases the property and then the next day they find out or the other person records, right? Sorry, that's too late. Is at the time you purchased. 
Uh, race notice is a situation where you were there recording first before the prior purchaser and you didn't know about it. If you were there first but you knew about the prior one, you did. And of course, race notice is whoever gets to the courthouse. And that's why there are very few jurisdictions that follow purely race. Because what? It's a mess. Everybody is running to the courthouse. I jumped the covenants because I wanted to do some examples. I know I jumped the covenants.